Hey everyone, so Aurora sent me this absolute monster to have a plate with, which is exactly what I'm going to do in this video. This is the Aorus RTX 3080 Extreme, and one of the highest end 3080s on the market. So I thought it'd be fun to do some overclocking with, and see how far I can push it. But first, let's remove this Activate Windows watermark, with today's video sponsor, SCD Key. They offer cheap OEM Windows 10 keys, so just head over there using the link in the description down below. If you enter the discount code TPC at checkout, you'll save yourself an additional 15% off. The key is delivered immediately, and then you can just search for Activate on your PC, and then put the code there, click Activate, and the watermark is gone. So back to the video. If having a premium unboxing experience matters to you, I must say that the Aorus Extreme has you covered. I mean, you even get a little chibi figure in black and gold, which means I have two now. So I really hope this is something that Aorus continues to do, so that people who upgrade a lot can start a little collection of them. Onto the card itself though, it's absolutely ginormous. Like, I don't actually know if I'm going to be able to get B-roll that adequately shows off the sheer size of this thing. It's 17mm thick, meaning that it's almost four slots wide, although it actually only uses up two PCIe slots in your case. And it uses three 8-pin power connectors, which is the most I've ever had on a GPU. It's an absolute beast of a card. It has this enormous heatsink, which adds a lot of weight to the card, and you can see copper pipes running through it. And there's three fans, which have this really interesting overlapping design. The middle fans blades are shaped slightly differently to be able to clear the other two, and it also spins in the opposite direction to the other two to help reduce turbulence. There is some degree of pass-through cooling, but not to the same amount that you get with the fans card. And the Extreme also doesn't really exhaust anything out of the rear of the case, instead it has more output ports. The 3080 Extreme is a dual bias card, and it has this little switch that allows you to switch between a silent mode and an OC mode, with OC being the default. I don't expect I'll use this for making the card more silent, but it's nice to have, as it makes flashing your VBIOS less scary, as you always have a backup BIOS. Then we have this really nice metal backplate on the back of the card, which features some added RGB. And on the other side of the cooler, we have this little LCD screen. I have to say that if I had any complaints about the cooler design, it would be these cables right here. It's just a minor cosmetic thing. But then I noticed that this cable is missing in all of Aorus's marketing renders, and it's even unplugged in their first look YouTube video, which is kind of sus and a bit pointless, seeing as they're sending this card out to reviewers to look around anyway. But anyway, it's time to get this card installed into a PC and see how it looks and performs. So, funny story, the card doesn't fit my workstation PC Lotus. It hits the cover for the power supply cables. And the Cooler Master SL600M isn't a small case. So hopefully this demonstrates just how big this card is. But I'm hoping that it will fit if I remove the power supply cover. So it's an hour later, and I finally managed to get it to fit. In the end, I had to remove the cable cover, but I do get to keep the cover plate, and that covers the cable from most angles anyway. This is just a temporary install, so ignore the messy, mismashed 8-pin cables. I didn't have enough sleeve ones. I ended up vertically mounting it, and I built a little Lego support tower to support the weight of the card on the end. I thought all the weight was on the PCI bracket, and the actual metal around the slots was starting to flex. So again, I cannot over-exaggerate this. This thing is an absolute unit of a card. But that's what makes it so cool. So, for the next bit of video, I recorded live audio from within the garage, but I then accidentally deleted that, so, yeah, <laughs> you, get, you get a voiceover instead. Um, so I'd set everything up and was ready to go, but I ran into this issue where the driver wouldn't stay installed and the screen just kept turning off. Um, now, looking back, it was probably just because the 3080 is a PCIe 4.0 card, but at the time I just ended up reinstalling the GPU non-vertically, and that fixed the issue. So yeah, given that this is Aorus's highest clock 3080, I thought that it could be fun to do some overclocking with it. And for this, I'm going to be using 3 Mark's Port Royal Benchmark. I've already ran this benchmark a few times with my Founders Edition 3080, and the best score that I could get with that was 12,198. And this was with an overclock of plus 160 on the core clock, which resulted in the card averaging 2,063 MHz during benchmark and plus 800 on the memory. With these modern NVIDIA cards, the GPU basically boosts itself until it hits limiting factor, and that could be temperature or power or voltage. And in the case of the Founders Edition card, it was limited by power. Usually, extreme overclockers will use custom biases or do physical modifications to a card to get more power, but us mere mortals are constrained by the restrictions of the power design in the BIOS. So with the founders, it uses two 8-pin power connectors, if you're using the little adapter. 
which means the card has a maximum wattage of 375 watts to stay within spec. So it's not surprising that Nvidia have limited this card to 370 watts. With the Aorus 3080 Extreme, however, it has three 8 pins, meaning that it should theoretically be able to do 525 watts within spec assuming that everything on the PCB actually allows for that much power and the GPU itself can handle it. Out of the box, the Extreme was limited to 370 watts, the same as the Founders, but thankfully, Aorus have released a BIOS since then, which increases the limit up to 450 watts, which justifies the third A-pin connector. And this is the BIOS that I'm using today, but I really hope the car can push to 500 watts in the future. Even with the 450 watt limit though, I should have no problems overtaking the Founders Edition, assuming I haven't completely lost the Silicon Lottery with this card. So for the first round of Port Royale, I decided to run it with just everything at stock, as this gives you a baseline number and allows you to see if the changes you're making are actually improving the performance or not, as it is possible for an overclock to appear stable, but actually make the card perform worse. So with no overclock and the latest VBIOS, the card is limited to 370 watts, and it scored 11,924, with an average clock frequency of 12,019 MHz. And I like to write all this down just to keep track. The next run that I did was with the power and temperature limits lifted, and this isn't overclocking in the traditional sense. You're just letting the card know that you're happy for it to use more power and to run hotter, and the GPU boost is going to take that into account when boosting. And now the card is using the full 450 watts, which is allowed with this BIOS. And it scored 12,089, with an average frequency of 2,066 megahertz. So this is only a 1.4% performance increase for 80 watts more power consumption. So obviously this isn't worth it in an everyday situation, but I don't care about everyday performance in this video. I just want to see how far I can push the card. So it was finally time to start increasing the clock speed. And for this, I decided to go up in plus 25 megahertz increments until I saw either freezes or low performance. And the card didn't freeze until plus 150 megahertz, which actually really surprised me, as the card is already overclocked out of the box. I did prod it a few times though to see if I could get a score at plus 150 megahertz, and I did, but this was lower than the card scored at stock at 11,912. So I then lowered it to plus 140 megahertz and tried that a few times, but it didn't make it all the way through the benchmark a single time. And then I lowered it to plus 135 megahertz. The first time it froze, but the second time I got my highest score so far, which was 12,566. So next I went to overclock the memory, but given the instability of my clock speed overclock, I decided to temporarily reset everything back to zero so that I could purely focus on just the memory. So this time I decided to go up in increments of plus 200, and at plus 800 I got a score of 12,307, but then at plus 1000 I only got a score of 11,207, so I knew I had to start decreasing it. I then tried plus 900 followed by plus 850, both of which also scored lowered than just plus 800 did. So it appears that plus 800 is the highest that this car can go, which is a little disappointing as I was hoping for it to be able to reach plus 1000, but alas. <laughs> so it was at this point that it was time to combine my clock speed overclock with my memory overclock and go for my highest score. I started by turning up the fans in my case, and then I turned up the fans on my CPU. I was doing this at 4am for a reason, I wanted to have the lowest possible ambient temperature possible. The thing is though, everything is a balancing act. Lowering the temperatures might cause GPU boost to clock higher than it's capable of, and my plus 135 overclock and MSI afterburner might suddenly be too difficult. Also, the card might be able to do the core clock overclock fine, and the memory overclock fine, but struggle to do them both combined. Which unfortunately was exactly what I found the case to be. At plus 135 and plus 800, the score was 12,586, which wasn't much higher than the card managed with just the GPU overclocked and the memory stock. I knew this could take multiple attempts to get through successfully, so I tried these settings multiple times, but that was the best score that I could get with those settings. I really was expecting a much higher score when combining those two overclocks. It just seemed like there was some sort of performance regression somewhere. So I kept playing with it for an hour, trying the core clock at both plus 130 and plus 135, and trying the memory clock at anywhere between plus 800 and plus 650, and I finally managed a pretty decent score of 12,632, which I was pretty happy with, and looking at the leaderboard for my CPU and my GPU, the score had me sitting at 13th place, which was respectable, but I wanted top 10, so 
I kept trying. <laughs> I'm just trying, you know, different different clock speeds, different memory speeds. And an hour later, at a clock speed of 135 and a memory clock of plus 750, I finally managed to get a score of 12,946. And my position on the leaderboard for the 3900X and 3080 was a huge surprise. I was in second place. What was even more crazy is that I was in 21st place for the 3080 with any CPU at all. So my GPU clock speed was 2250 and this was actually better than most of the scores above my own, but I hadn't been very lucky with the VRAM. Still, sitting in 21st was a real surprise to me as I was just using a stock cooled air called 3900X and the only thing that I turned on was XMP, that's it. And the memory is a 64 gig kit of T-Force Vulcan Z, like just 3200 megahertz at C16 with nothing additional done to the timings. So it was really just the strength of the GPU clock speed alone that got me that high on the leaderboard. So I fully expect that if I was on Intel or a SEM3 chip that my score would have increased. But that will be the next stage of my overclocking adventures. My 5900X has just arrived and so has my new Team Group Extreme 3600MHz C14 memory. Plus I have lots of water cooling parts so I'm really looking forward to seeing where this overclocking journey takes me and learning along the way because this is all new to me. And like this really has just been the basics of GPU overclocking. I haven't played with voltages, I haven't done any power mods and I'm nowhere near trying Sub-Zero. So I'm hoping you enjoy this sort of content because then I'll be able to pursue this more in future uploads. And to make it even more fun, I've challenged fellow tech YouTuber, not an Apple fan, to see who can get the highest score of 3080. So that should add a fun level of competition. Hashtag RipNeff. But yeah, so lastly, before I give you my final thoughts on the card, I want to talk to you about the screen. Now, I'm not going to tell you that you need a display on your GPU. There's really nothing it can tell you that you couldn't just put on an overlay or on a secondary monitor. But let's be honest, having little displays on your PC hardware is just plain cool. You can set it up with one of three different looking readouts, and I personally prefer Enthusiast 1, and this will show you all the things you'd want to know about what your GPU is up to. And for overclocking, I really like TGP because it just adds some fun to it when you can see 450 watts on the side of your card. And I did have some fun finding different gifts to put on the card. But yeah, if you like customising your RGB lighting, having a display takes customising the system to a whole new level. Speaking of RGB though, the card does have plenty of that too. So I went into this video thinking that I wasn't going to like this card. I've always found the really ultra premium variants of any GPU to be a bit excessive because ultimately this is a 3080, it's limited to being a 3080 and you can get a 3080 in your build for much less if you pick a less fancy card design. Like often the most expensive version of a card will cost more than the cheapest version of the card above it, although that's not the case here until the 3080 Ti exists. But I found that I've changed my mind on the card a bit. Like firstly, if you're the type of person that spends money on the aesthetics of your build, then the ARS Extreme can justify some added expense here. With its sheer size and LCD screen, the card becomes the centrepiece of any build that it's installed in. And secondly, there's the overclocking. I've really enjoyed my time overclocking on this card. Like the RTX 3018 Ampere in general isn't a great overclocker, and I wouldn't be looking to overclock to improve my day-to-day -day gaming with this card. But there's just something about this card in particular that's just reignited my interest in the competitive part of overclocking, and I can't wait to experiment further. So if you're someone who just wants to game, then this 3080 probably isn't for you. Save some money, buy a cheaper model, and put the difference towards a new SSD or something. But if you're someone who enjoys the aesthetics of your PC, and you think this matches the look you're after, if you're someone who wants to have a play with overclocking and want a card that really helped push the 3080 to its limits, then the AOS Extreme could be the right card for you. So if you like this video, please hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already and you want to see more of my videos. Thank you so much to my incredible patrons and thank you all for watching.